Thank you, Rick, uh, for the introduction. So, I mean, just as a quick background, what, what I do basically is try to map three distinct things. One is different kinds of data because I'm, I'm trained in handling lots of data. And, and then using more social theory to compute that and model that form of data to address two distinct public policy problems. One is the distributive justice, which is how do you affect or how do you emphasize that equity and equality are maintained in, in the policy process. And, and then it's very specific to energy and climate policies. The other thing being is on uh, misinformation. So how does misinformation on climate spreads? And especially, how do you uh, place people in, in that conversation so that you reduce that misinformation as well? So that, that's the other bit. And I'm also, I mean, just yesterday, I came to know that I'm an inaugural Cambridge Zero Fellow. So that's a new thing to me. But then why, why it's important that we understand uh, this uh, decolonizing uh, literature, especially from a knowledge production point of view? It's because recently there has been a lot of writing regarding systematic biases in lots of big journals and, and kind of this uh, science specific literature. But then what's interesting is that, that they have now trickled down to more climate and energy policy problems as well, because one policy which is derived, let's say, in the global north is not directly applicable to global south because they lack context. And that's that's what's very interesting that how do you em embed uh, some of these context into this literature, especially when you are working with multi country and multi like uh, different collaborations across different spaces. So that's the next question why this knowledge is important and especially I'll Towards the end of the talk, I'll slightly turn this around to the architectural field as well, that why it's very important to look into these knowledge production gaps in, 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 in today's time, more specifically. So I, I work specifically on climate and energy. So one thing with climate is that climate action is that the, how do you reduce uh, emissions at, at large scale, at country scale, even at a very local scale, that is at, at home level, at within an individual scale. And if we look at how we have done so far, it's really bad because you can see like it's 2021 and we are still rising quite a lot in, in the carbon dioxide emission that contributes to uh, climate change and uh, global warming. And similarly, why energy and climate are so interrelated? It's because you see that energy use in buildings is a massive contributor to these emissions. And even with this, the energy is the biggest global greenhouse gas emission, I mean, emitting sector. And more specifically, this is from uh, data from 2016. So, I mean, now it's even more. And, and that, that's a problem that we are working constantly toward decarbonization or reducing this emission, but we, we don't actually have any results so far. And, and that's a concern even in forms of, in terms of climate action. So two, uh, I mean, two, uh, overlapping con uh, concepts that came up in, in these global climate action. So one is called energy justice and the other is related to it. It's called climate justice, which are interconnected to each other. So energy justice is a concept or a, a very strong conceptual element, which talks about how do you uh, elevate energy insecurity, energy poverty, or, or kind of like energy burdens. And then there are different ways to do that. So one way being is understanding the distribution. So how do you ensure that every people have equal access to energy services, it is affordable, it is accessible across different socioeconomic uh, status. And that is uh, the core of distributive justice uh, when we speak. And this is quite critical because now let's think about you are planning for renewable energy in a remote village in some place where there is no formal grid connection of electricity. Now this renewable, how do you ensure that the people who don't have access to electricity, how do they pay for it? Or how, how do you transport from a supply side as well? That how do you take it there? Who invests? And what are the costs associated with it? And who bears the costs? So that's why this energy justice is very much connected with climate justice context. And because these are overlapping. So climate justice means, for example, a country that emits a lot of carbon emissions and is responsible for a lot of these global warming related disasters. So hurricanes, floods, but then these are borne by people who live in coastal areas who are mostly, let's say, fishermen uh, of a community, or I'm not talking about the high income people who have like mansions facing seaside, but rather the people who are 
very much dependent on sea and, and fishing. So these flooding and extreme weather events affect them very inappropriately. And that is why it is very important to understand how do we uh, have this distributive justice across the scales. And it can be at individual, at a country level, or even at a community scale. And the last bit, which forms on, and it's, I can, you can see like it's all interconnected, is environmental justice. And, and that connects with all the things that has to do with reducing pollution. And then you have safer drinking water, safer services, safer air, and, and everything that is contributing to better health and well-being and also better planet. So with, with this, so this context and these concepts basically connect this energy and climate debates. And, and it, has, it has been one of the hot topic in uh, social science research as well. So what's the decolonization challenge in this? And the, I mean, one of the thing is that has to do with how these research agendas and policies are formed. So you can see here, this image basically, I mean, summarizes it, it very well in a way that what are the policy failures that you can see. And I mean, it, it may look quite complex, but the very basic meaning is that research, which is done in high income countries, is the most influence on policy making in low income countries. And, and that is a very important point because of this influence bit. So who influences what? That's the question. And whether this influence in a good way or in a bad way that suppresses some of these distributive effects over there. And the other point, which, which is known quite well in the entire field and the, even within the experts and also with the policymakers that international policy lessons don't travel fast uh, or I mean, they don't travel at all. And, and that's a problem because there is no exchange of knowledge sharing. So again, it's like one person having a high influence on the other based on, I mean, certain variables. And, and that's what we are going to study today, that what, what cons constitute these effects. And then why this gap exists is because of this, you can see that there is a, I mean, there is a lack of context, local knowledge and context in policymaking. And, and especially when you are taking a research from let's say Cambridge, and then you are doing it in some, some remote places that how, how do you contextualize even in, even a very technical problem like placing a renewable grid. So how do you make it that the person for whom you are making it, they are actually uh, able to use that service for a longer time and sustain it for some time. So according to literature, and, and these are all published articles, there are some of the, I mean, numbers which are quite, I mean, interesting because you can see like the first one is have, so, have shown that only 15% of article published in, I mean, in developmental journals. So the journals which specifically focus on developmental stuff. And between 1990 and 2019 have were researchers from uh, developing countries. So this number is very small. And also the other bit is they, these articles actually receive very few citations. And then that's, I mean, someone has recently done it in 2021. Even for example, like in economics, in the field of economics, which is very uh, instrumental in creating these policies and also the financial bit of these uh, certain energy services, you can see that only a quarter of paper on African countries have Africa-based authors. And, and that's again, a, lack of local context in these spaces. So that's that's what we are discussing, that you need to have that local knowledge in, in that form of when you are trying to derive uh, recommendations for, for a, or generalize it for a country. Now, a term that is widely used is something called helicopter research. And that is very core to decolonization because helicopter research likes, so HIC is short from, from high income countries and LMIC is low and middle income countries. So helicopter research usually like is referred to, uh, it's, now it's widely referred to as researchers from high income countries goes to a low income country, collect data and then fly back to high income country and then draw a conclusion. So th that's the, I mean, cycle that creates these knowledge imbalances because you just go there to collect data and then you bring the data and use your own theoretical and, and conceptual knowledge to derive those uh, conclusions. So, I mean, the debates around decolonizing research, I mean, that's a big problem even now that they are virtually non-existent. And I mean, this is, this is a problem across disciplines that people don't actually see that as a problematic enough. And, and then just by collaboration with some other doesn't ensure that you are actually decolonizing that field. So that, that remains one of the, again, key gaps that there are very less number of studies. And 
the other form with empirical studies is that you derive the empirical metric and then you just leave it to that. Uh, and, and most of these empirical evidences are primary from primarily from developed economies. I mean, in fact, there are studies which show that the likelihood, likelihood of you publishing in a very top journal is higher from an institute like Cambridge or Princeton or MIT than uh, from a very, very good institute from somewhere else. So that, that bit always remains in, in it. And, and that these are some of the energy specific decolonizing problems. So again, now with it more recent research, so you can see that I have quoted just transition because that's a very important uh, concept where it talks about that, how do you ensure when you move or when you reduce emissions uh, from a country across different sectors that how do you ensure it's equal and equitable? And so that the, I mean, the benefits are equally distributed among the classes of the society. And, and that is very important because many scholars have said that so far, research have really neglected these, uh, I mean, these decolonizing aspects in this just transition context. And most of these agendas are set in global north. So for example, I mean, and I, I'm, take, I'm taking slightly broader scope here, for example, lots of these climate change conferences, which are by United Nations, are actually held in Global North, and they set the agenda. But it's slightly different because there are people representing from most of the countries of the world. But then that remains one of the problems for core research, like funding is from Global North, the agenda is set in the Global North, and, and that creates this barrier for just transition. And then, I mean, I was just mentioning to Edith that I follow Kasten Broto's work quite a lot, and she is quite, uh, I mean, vocal about these kind of disbalances or imbalances in this. And that talks about that there are energy justice issues across embedded in national borders. So that means like, for example, a rich country is bordered with a poorer country. So the benefits do not ever travel across the borders of, for example, in a, a policy that is, uh, situated for both the countries or designed for both the countries. And there are many examples of it, but she very nicely explained it in a very theoretical framework way that how these spatial injustices happen. And I mean, there is this term called energy bullying by high income countries. So that, that means generally a high income country is saying to a low income country that you have to reduce coal consumption, oil consumption, because you are creating emissions and contributing to climate change. So this someone who is being authoritative on this is sometimes sometimes related to as energy uh, bullying. So what what we did in our paper with colleagues from UCL and uh, Chalmers University in Sweden is that we started to look into World Bank data to where GDP is one of the key indicator, and then also look into the published work uh, around I mean from I think 1966 basically to try to figure out how whether this is true in a more quantitative and empirical way, and how do you look at this. Uh, dissimilarities at a large global scale, especially when you look into this energy uh, research. So from, from the, uh, I mean, the number of papers that we filtered, so just by typing energy development, uh, I mean, developing and countries, we got around 30,000 papers. But then that, that's the problem. Like there are so many mismatch of keywords between what we wanted to see and, and people focusing on there. Then we started to filter it across different ways, I mean, by funding, who funds it, and, and then like uh, more categories on environmental science and like energy fuel and economics, energy economics and some of these categories. So that came to around 6,636 papers that we specifically look at. So the first thing is quite interesting is, so uh, using, like I mentioned here, using network science, which basically helps you map uh, the origin and destination of two points. So that's very interesting to see like how network science also help us in understanding this research because these are all collaborative works. So author in Cambridge works with US. I mean, I work a lot and same. So you that's these are actually networks which you can map and then have a broad picture of what's happening. So across this paper, you can see that this is a like a global collaborative map across these topics. And you can see that where are these density of these lines are. And that basically shows like where this research is going. So for example, Europe is highly dense. Same is with uh, US over there. But then what happens to the global South countries? I mean, there is some density, high dense networks in China and in India and, and in 
uh, Australia, but Australia is not a global South country. So mostly around Sub-Saharan Africa and, and in Latin America, and, and that be, there are, I mean, no lines basically. And, and that's one of the first observation that it's highly dense uh, towards the global north uh, for all of these collaborations. The second is uh, the color, basically the darker the color that shows that the number of papers these countries produce on these topics of energy policy. And you can see again, the same trend. I mean, there is a huge gray chunk here where there is absolutely no data or there is no representation on those countries. And, and that's again, a big problem that why they don't exist. I mean, some countries don't have there because of geopolitical situations, but uh, in, in general, where there is gray, it's a problematic state that they are really badly underrepresented in the literature. The next is uh, basically trying to figure out how these citation trends develop over time. So, I mean, the most easiest way to read this graph is see the yellow line. And over time, it's the developed country who are actually producing a lot of this research on energy. Whereas there are some catching up by China and BRICS basically transfer Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, these nations. But in general trend is that most of this stuff is done in developed countries and that's the first trend. And because it is developed here, so that's why you will see like lots of citation going up and, and it's a factor of 10 or even more than that. So that means it's a huge differences over there. So now again, what's quite interesting in this here. So you can see here the, X axis basically talks about GDP of a country. So GDP basically shows how rich or poor the country is. It's called gross domestic product. And then the Y axis shows the total number of citations across that country as a, I mean, as a, at a country level. Uh, so, I mean, the more you can see over there, the top uh, corner, or we call it quadrant, in the top quadrant is US and China, Japan. So these are all, kind of a developed country. I mean, except the exception for CH and China because they produce a lot of scientific literature. And here it's all the low income countries which are at the lagging bit. And then in, in between there are some countries which are, they have a high GDP, but their scientific production is relatively lower because I mean, uh, maybe lower number of universities or lower collaboration in those spaces, especially like Singapore, and, and some places like uh, TU or Turkey, Mexico, those places. So the pop we also found that the population size of a country has nothing to do with this. So that means it doesn't matter that whether your countries have high density like India or very low density, it doesn't matter whether you correlate with GDP or not. And again, so that's again another uh, divide basically that how uh, high income countries have really high production and they are always high in, in that scale. So the next one, which is again quite interesting is that what happens when the country of uh, the first author of a paper belongs to a country with low or high GDP and, and the country of study, because that's one of the things in collaboration, right? Like a first author can be a person from with whom the study is based, or he may not have any connection with the uh, country of study, especially in this kind of developing paper. So you can see here, it's like the difference gets really low. Uh, I mean, the difference spreads a lot between the first author of the country and the country of study. That means, for example, uh, author in US who is a first author, he is studying a low income country in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, I mean, he gets a lot of citation and that has been a quite, a, I mean, a significant representation in the US cases. So for US, this is very distinct that the difference is very high. That means the first author is from a US. Yeah. I mean, now we don't know whether he is a citizen of US or a president or someone. It's just their affiliation is with the US university. And they produce a lot of study on a country that is not US. So that's one of the key takeaway. And, and that is quite common across these red, red uh, dots, which are basically developed countries. And, and that's again, one of the key knowledge production differences that being a first author uh, in University of Cambridge, I will, there is a high chance that I am the one who is focusing on Rwanda or, or some other places like India or, or yeah, like Pakistan and, and those bits. But then uh, first author from Pakistan may not be actually contributing to that study. And, and that's the, I mean, I'll come to that's where the differences come in. 
same here you can, i mean this is again a simplified version of the gdp uh, story that i was seeing but it's based on funding so i mean obvious that the global north will have more funding and they do fund a lot of this research but you can see like they are the one where the like number of studies by authors from developed countries are really dense over there because of this funding requirement and and especially since the funding originate from these developed countries so that's the main uh, like dense bit and that has high uh, correlation with G i mean funding of the gdp and gdp of the country so the richer country funds more study i mean that's the end of the story and especially study on these uh, developing and decolonizing research in energy uh, topics so now when we look at which universities actually contribute to this so you can see that here the size of basically the size determines the contribution of these specific universities so we are also there university of cambridge with berkeley and Tsinghua yeah, University. And so what's interesting over here is like who, I mean, in this network, it's very interesting to see who basically kind of contributes to what other institutes. So for example, like Tsinghua uh, works a lot with Beijing Normal University. So that's a very local and an in-country uh, collaboration that's very strong over there. But then do they like collaborate with someone like Berkeley or Cambridge, so there is no, I mean, there is a very thin line. So size of these lines are called edges, which basically shows that what's the influence of these interconnections are. And same with like National University of Singapore is with some uh, other university, I, I can't read there, but that's university is based in China as well. So that's again, like very localized kind of, I mean, localized means South-South collaboration. So there is a very strong element of North-North and South-South collaboration rather than crossing these global north and global south border here. And when you look over here, so all the dots that lit up are basically, so this is very, I mean, very distinct. So HI is the high income, UMI is the upper middle income. This is low middle income and low income. So low income, you can see there is hardly any white dot, which basically shows the contribution of this country towards our uh, database of 6,700 almost 6,700 papers. But then from the high income countries, it is very distinct that it moves more towards high income uh, countries, the whole entire, I mean, uh, corpus of literature. But then there are certain uh, kind of like exceptions. For example, in upper middle income, Malaysia, China, Brazil, and South Africa have significantly higher contributing. I mean, in relationship to the other countries, they have significantly higher contribution. And this, I mean, the y-axis is the uh, country of focus of that study. So what does China study more? Which country do they study more? So the lit, I mean, the white color basically shows that. So here is like, I mean, you can see it more clearly in your laptop when you try to read the graph more clearly because there are so many countries of the world uh, represented here. And also what's interesting from this origin to destination point of view, is that the x-axis is relatively lower than y-axis. So that means the focus of this country where the study is originating is really low towards other countries. And, and that's again another, I mean, bridge that's there. So relating to there are not many studies. So it relates with basically this graph that I showed that there are many gray areas across this uh, scientific production. And that's one of the main cause that not every country is studied in an equal kind of attention. I mean, forget about global south, global north. Even within that, there are lots of biases. Who studies what and why Why do we study that country? And, and that's a kind of a global picture. Like for example, this uh, long, yeah. So this one, which has the highest lit up is basically US. And US is one of the country that almost touches every country in terms of the topic or in terms of a case study area. But for other countries, they don't. And more specifically for someone like China, Malaysia, Brazil, and South Africa, they are very uh, kind of localized. So they will be more interested in South-South or, or nearer neighbor collaborations rather than doing a longer collaboration. Same with India, like since India is part of this BRICS and there are lots of funding that flows within this BRICS nation, there is a huge collaboration with Brazil. And, and same, it, it goes with 
many of those, especially like in, in uh, Russia and, and China and, and those places, of course, UK and US are also there. So now we, we know that there are some of this pattern that is very distinct to global south, global north, south, south, and north, north kind of knowledge production in energy knowledge. But then what's interesting, even when we do regression analysis to find that what's the interrelationship between these variables, it says, it says that the GDP of a like author, I mean, GDP of the country of an author explains 55% of variation in total citation. So that means if you are an author from a high income country, you are 55% more likely to be cited uh, than someone who is from a low income country. And, and that's the like more generalized finding. Uh, same with like at a country level, 1% increase in GDP is, I mean, is likely that you will get 0.68% higher citation. And then that's again, a very economic indicator that how uh, in imbalances and uh, kind of the economy also plays a quite important role in, in these things. So, I mean, you can again see in bracket that population has no effect. So it doesn't mean that highly populated countries have higher uh, citation or something like that. And then again, from the, our papers that we studied uh, from that sample itself, like primary authors from sub-Saharan Africa are 10% less likely to be cited. And, and that's just, I'm talking just about the energy policy. Bit. So there will be like even core technical energy topics like batteries and materials and all of this. So even, uh, I mean, not considering that. And what's good is, is like, but then what's good in all of this is if you have a mixture of authors or a multi-country author, the generalizability of that study is quite high. So that means that you are likely to derive some recommendations or policy implication that is generalizable across the space. And, and that's a good uh, sign for collaboration. And I mean, continuing this kind of collaborations. So, I mean, some reflection on this, and, and I will try to make it more easy as possible, is that, again, as I mentioned, that this kind of critical theory approach, so I, I give you a very macro view at a more global scale that how these differences are. But when you do your research, I mean, bringing is the, in this local context and norms are very important in policy recommendations, because that's what will make impact to the local knowledge. And also from a more uh, kind of like broad field view is that there is really a lack of studies which actually brings out this. And, and that's very important. It's not just energy, but across architecture and even social policy and that kind of field. And same with local knowledge, knowledge and research infrastructure. So these are not represented well enough and, and there are no standardized way to understand it. So, I mean, is, is there a website that you can help understand at least a bit of that? And again, that remains a problem. And what's uh, like what's good is that a lot of these implications are derived from experiential learning. So you go to a place, you experience the local culture, norms and context, you bring it back. And the expectation is that you put them in your research, but sometimes it becomes helicopter research and that becomes a problem. And why helicopter research is more relevant? It's because it's, it's quite high in fields like economics and developmental economics where you are very much dependent on large data size. So for example, you need data in, in thousands and multiples of thousands. So there it, it becomes quite high that they become just a data collection point of view. And this, again, what's interesting and very, I mean, highly recommended in decolonizing is, I mean, that I also personally believe is that reducing this kind of citation equality is important to build trust that a research that is coming from which is not the which is not University of Cambridge is also trustable and is also of that quality uh, and and that also brings trust in the local authors the peer review process and also bringing in some of the knowledges that that local context have and so I mean it's not just the responsibility of the high income countries but also for low income countries usually what's noticed here the policymakers are just they sign these big grants and, and collaborations between countries and they just leave it up to that. So that, that's not the way to do it. It's like there has to be institutional effort to make aware of that. I mean, how, how do you adopt some of the policies that is formed in, in uh, global north or high income countries or being funded by those places? And, and I think that's 
quite interest. And yeah, I mean, these are some of the takeaways. And I mean, this is the last point is very much from a paper's point of view that how do we understand and contribute this uh, distributive justice gap is by basically understanding this local context and bringing in this local knowledge in the policy making process. So this has been more for uh, engineer, I mean, energy side of things, but I, I strongly feel that there are lots of relevance for architecture point of view, especially when we talk about at a global scale, when the emission reduction is a very strong theme these days to as a climate action. And especially buildings have to play a very strong role in how do you do that. And this kind of local knowledge can be, I mean, I found this very nice diagram uh, on a like paper called uh, climate sensitive architecture and it talks across scales so right from an individual to i mean national city and, and across a very big scale that they the main message that they are trying to emphasize is that as an architect or as an urban planner it's very important that you bring in the local climate sensitive knowledge in the planning process or in the design process and that is directly related with how do you uh, reduce energy in buildings and then as we know that i mean I hope you know that in building emission reduction, two more most important thing is energy consumed in operating the building and, uh, and the emissions that is re uh, I mean, released due to that. And the second part is the carbon emissions that is embedded in the building materials and construction process. And, and that, that has been some of the work that we were trying to do across different partners is that trying to understand how high level policy events that is taking place like COP, which is by United Nations, and they try to form these policies around at a global scale. They affect public uh, attitudes and sentiments, and, and especially emotions towards it. So are people reactive to some of the uh, policies that is formed around this? And this is basically using Twitter data set, where we try to map over 13 year period that how people tweet over it, and whether there is a correlation between the tweets, versus the uh, what governments or policymakers have kind of uh, said. So the idea is that that bringing some of the people centric context and, and more of, so you can see like these two graphs basically shows negative and positive emotions in the tweets versus like lots of other emotions, which is like disgust, fear, anger, sadness. So these are like the reactive element that is to a policy. And that's a very strong context that you can see over uh, like over a time. So, I mean, this is not specific to a country, but this is a global scale because Twitter helps you get that kind of data. And I, I mean, this is also like we are doing in collaboration with Institute like Alan Turing Institute and Caltech, which is like very good in this handling this kind of large scale data sets. So what's interesting is that you can see over time uh, with the increase in engagement of Twitter, there is a, like the graphs become more stable. And that is more interesting for the red bit, that's the negative sentiments and the like the green is positive sentiment. It, it shows that when people engage more with this kind of topics, especially like climate change and, and reducing emissions in building, they become more aware. And, and then they try to make a kind of a more informed judgment about their reaction towards certain tweets. And, and that's quite interesting over time that how this graph stabilizes. And I mean, there are more to it. I, I won't show because of time constraint. But then the other way that we are doing is, is like trying to understand how vernacular kind of knowledge basically helps you decolonize architecture. And, and th this has been a cross scale. And uh, at CNMI, we are trying to use that in understanding natural materials. So many people there are working on earth from different parts of the world and trying to understand how they contribute to low carbon uh, I mean, architecture and construction sector with this idea of decolonizing these bits. So that's some of the stuff that are quite translatable to architectural field. Okay, so I had an acknowledgement site where everyone was there who worked on it, but it's somehow it's not here. So, I mean, Darcy is here, so thanks to him. And there are many other people as well. But then, yeah, so th that's why some of the, key messages. I mean, uh, it, it, I think it got slightly complicated, but uh, it, it's fine. Yeah. So, I mean, the last slide that I want to engage is, is this one, because I think this is a very strong takeaway that why 
it's always the global north where the densities are higher than the global south and that should be one of the key questions when you also do your own research that how do you make sure you contribute to putting a dot in those places where there are no dots so that's it thank you Thank you very much, Ronnie, for um, this insightful talk um, and about, I guess, our role uh, as, as educators, researchers, lots of students. <laughs> um, yeah, to um, um, to think uh, not about uh, yeah to think about the way that we produce knowledge and who are we engaging engaging with and how and from where and. and uh, uh, and what are the best ways to, to, to influence it and, and to change uh, the current quite alarming figures uh, that, you, that you show uh, and discuss. Um, I wonder if there are any questions from the, uh, those who are with us online or uh, from people here. Um, we have a bit of time uh, for Q&A. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, thank you. It was really, it was really interesting. I think we talk about these things in the sort of our ethics class, but we don't see it in a sort of paper review and critical approach to research like this. So it was really helpful. Um, and I guess I have so many questions, but I don't know what I should say first. I guess my first thing when you're talking about your analysis, I, I was quite curious as to why you chose GDP or what your critical position to the GDP as the main criteria was, because it is by default an index that favors global north countries right because so many of these global south countries have informal economies which aren't accounted into um so yeah so i guess that was the first question of wondering what your position was on that and i guess that in itself that's also a critical thing to use a global north tool to study a global yeah. south issue um and then i was also curious about i don't know if this at all was part of your research but i was really curious about the impact of um colonial countries and what that meant in terms of the papers and the university accesses that they had. So I know that if you take um, human development index, for example, it will tell you how many people have access to university. And I'm assuming that a lot of global South countries will have a way lesser ratio than what global yeah. North countries are winning, which means that in any way, because it's such a process to get into academia and be able to write a peer reviewed paper anyway, you're, it's almost like the threshold keeps getting smaller and smaller, which I guess is exactly what your research is yeah, talking exactly. about. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I was just wondering what this process was and, and if you found any link between, if you found that those relationships of networks um, were strong between sort of previous colonizing countries and their pr previous colonized countries or not at all, or if there was any correlation. Yeah, I mean, for the first GDP bit, uh, so we took GDP because that's still, I mean, sadly is a very standard economic indicator that's used by UN at least at, at that level. And so, that was one of the key reasons that why we specifically look into GDP because a lot of funding is based on that and they don't look into HNI and uh, to my limited knowledge, but they may have changed now. So to make a case that even if we look at through GDP, there are these disbalances or imbalances. So that's one point. And the second is for your bit, it, we haven't specifically looked into colonized versus, I mean, non-colonized countries, but Definitely, there is a very strong network effect between South South and I mean neighboring effect. So it's it's like India China will have more uh, cooperations or collaborations with Singapore and and some of these. But then again, there is this GDP factor in play. So Singapore has more uh, GDP. So that means the funding flows or I mean student flows, researcher flows can be higher in that compared to some countries like India or Pakistan. So. I mean, I have seen some papers who have actually looked into donor and funders relation in this context, like how donor uh, actually determines a lot of the outcomes of how people will travel, what, what their outcomes will be, what their research will be. So yeah, this is definitely there and I'm sure it will be there for colonized versus uh, non-colonized effects as well. Other question? Thank you. Yeah, one, I mean, it was really interesting to see the map with mm -hmm. all of the kind of yeah. communication lines, it's such a cool way of showing it. Um, and I guess it raises the question about the decolonization of knowledge production versus mm -hmm. the decolonization of sort of communication. Mm -hmm. 
because you are like mapping it on yeah. how much things are published mm -hmm. and in itself that valorizes the communication of this knowledge mm -hmm. through yeah. academic research mm -hmm. and there are so many barriers to access of that exactly so like yeah. i guess are there I don't know. I'm completely oblivious on it. No, no. I, I, I think. Communication, but like other other modes of communication. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm. Sorry. Yeah, that's a very nice question because the answer is like very specific to my skill set. So there are other ways to look into this that we haven't seen. Is like newspaper articles or or like local newspapers versus some other international newspaper and their coverage on some of these policy recommendations. So I usually do a lot of natural language processing as a method to understand this kind of text. And that's exactly what we are mm -hmm. trying to do next, basically. The first is to understand that, like with, with this assumption that some country have less access to some of these journals or, or this knowledge production, is there any other ways where these messages are communicated? Is it newspaper? Is it like policy brief? Or is it like some donor funding reports that informs a government or something? And, and tools like natural language processing and, and I mean, yeah, machine learning, AI, they actually help you understanding millions of data points. And, and the bit that I showed on Twitter is basically that. So we looked into close to quarter of a million tweets over a 13 year period, and that actually showed the reactiveness to some of this stuff. Can, I, I can, can we add a question? Because I, I had a question, I was hesitating a bit. I mean, first of all, thank you for fascinating and yes. very thorough research. I mean very important contribution to this, this debate, but I was curious about, about language. And, and one of the, I guess in the decolonial debate, uh, one of the key issues is, is, the, is, 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 well, is yeah, one of the many key issues is the fact that some knowledges could be uh, ignored because they're not written. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because, because traditions are oral or, or, or somewhat different. Yeah. So, 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 so you still rely on whether or not you look at journals or newspapers or policy papers. Yeah, it's always written language, mm. and I'm and I'm wondering in in this context of knowledge production, mm. how can we precisely decolonize yes. uh, the terms uh, or the mechanisms we use to measure knowledge, mm. uh, which rely very heavily on the written. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I I think that's that's a very good and a tough question so uh, i think my always answer i mean always i give this answer is that we always have to rely also on the thick data that exists and basically i mean i showed a big data kind of a skill but then there is this thick data which is embedded deep inside the cultural and the local norms and and that's where is like this context generalization exists so i mean as a part of my phd i actually went to the people who live in slums in Brazil, India, Nigeria, and then try to understand that what are the barriers you face to energy access. And those were not there in any of the like government documents or anything because they are itself so underrepresented and, and no one will write that bit. So yeah, I, I think this bit of qualitative research, which is very ethnographic and people centric, I mean, have immense value in understanding and uncovering this kind of bit. So yeah, I mean, for from a very modeling and quantitative point of view these journal papers do exist but they also show that there is this imbalances embedded in themselves because i mean again this i have taken the web of science repository and web of science is based in i mean either uk us or netherlands and they have their access issues in, in themselves so yeah and then the other question yeah I have one, if I may. Um, you uh, talked about generalizing. Uh, you, you, I guess you, you discussed this, some of the reasons for these imbalances and biases uh, are because of um, of the fact that in many countries in the global north or, or west there are. Uh, uh, there is research that is comparing between a variety of countries. Uh, and uh, we can call it this kind of universalist approach you know, to research and to research yeah. problems. And I, I, I imagine that this is one of the reasons that you know, most of the uh, papers and citations are coming from there because then the yeah. uh, researchers from these countries just compare between exactly. uh, different yeah. countries in the global south. You talked about uh, the, the fact that general, the, this uh, generalization 
behind this research is a positive thing. Mm. Uh, so I have, um, um, yes, uh, I guess three related questions. A, why, why is it? Why do you see it as, as positive? And and, and I'm, I'm sure that creating global policies is important, but uh, it would be uh, great if you could describe the, the, the particular values in that. Um, um, and if if it is positive, how can we begin uh, to create it from the south? Mm -hmm. Because you were pointing on particular countries such as Brazil and China that uh, uh, that are creating these kind of comparative yeah. approaches, but mainly related to their yeah. areas rather than uh, to to, yeah. to to global. So how do we how do we do this from the south? Yeah, I, I think with this generalizable context, one thing that we found is having a mixture of authors is much more likely that you will find research which is broadly generalizable across south and globe i mean north and south and and i think this thing that is created in the south south collaborations are a quite nice starting point like bricks and uh, so it's like i mean even in the bricks context i am talking at such a high level because they have so much diversity and heterogeneity within the countries itself and if you are able to create a generalizable outcome or a discussion for the BRICS, I think that's a very strong outcome in itself. And so again, there is this point that I think like South-South will always be somewhat different than North-North because of the different variables in itself. But then if we can see that there is a very strong BRICS-based contribution or a South-South-based contribution, I think it's a very good start to what we call as distributive justice literature, because you are kind of making, you're acknowledging that there is this distribution that exists, but we are trying to map it with equity and equality and a different kind of, but meaningful ways of solving these problems. So, yeah. Other questions? Maybe online? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah, so, thank, uh, you. thank you, Ramit, for for the uh, discussion today. I think we've learned uh, quite a lot on on you know on the issues at stake and what we need to address again when we create scholarship and also when we cite when we reference people whom should we reference and and think about the politics of referencing, yeah. uh, um, which is behind it behind the the scholarship that we write and 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 educate students from the first stages of them writing dissertations and, and thesis work on, on, on the way to cite and, and the, the, the global politics yeah. uh, behind it. Uh, so thank you so much. And I invite you all to join us. So yes. Yeah, so, uh, two weeks from now, we have another talk by uh, Nishat uh, Awan, uh, who will talk about border areas and the topological atlas as a way of decolonizing the atlas. So I invite you all to join us, those online and those who are, who are here. So thank you. And you're invited to enjoy the drinks. And the thank snacks. you. Those